Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Immaculata DeVivo, and I'm uh, the Life uh, Science Advisor for this year. And I want to welcome everyone to the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. We are continuing uh, our series um, on gene editing, making the cut. Uh, this was a very successful uh, science symposium that we held in October. And like all of the symposiums at Radcliffe, it used a very much a multidisciplinary approach. During that symposium, we took a broad look at the aspects of gene editing that we are now following up with specific seminars. Uh, we touched upon the science, the clinical aspects, and bioethics. And to that, um, to that end, we've had seminars on uh, xenotransplantation, uh, editing for persons with disabilities. And today, we will have one uh, from a clinical aspect, uh, Humanizing Drug Discovery by David Altschler. But before I, I do a formal uh, introduction, uh, we, I want to plug two upcoming lectures, one on April 20th by Osagi Obasagi on bioethics, race, and eugenics. And uh, the upcoming uh, very exciting dean's lecture will uh, host uh, Ann Wojcinski, the founder of 23andMe, which is uh, the genetic testing, uh, the, the very the consumer available to the consumer. You can actually get it online. And she will be here on April 7th. And before I give the, the, the wiki, the CV version of David Altschler, I want to, uh, I'm really very excited to have David here. And it was a pleasure when he accepted uh, the invitation. I've known David for about 20 years, and I, I said that uh, because we were both child prodigies. And when I came to Harvard in um, 20 years ago or so, I had the great fortune of meeting David as part of the, this human genome project work. Uh, I was mostly interested in genetic variation and how we would use that in human population studies. And uh, David and uh, his colleagues, I don't want to name anybody in particular, they were sort of putting the finishing touches on the human genome. And from that human genome, we learned so much. And for me, the richness with respect to human variation and how we would use that in population-based studies. And David always had this vision uh, of using this sort of information from a clinical aspect and how do we really help people. And so it gave me great pleasure uh, to have him talk about this topic, which is humanizing drug, dis drug discovery. And so with that, I won't talk anymore and embarrass the the two of us, I will go into the formal presentation of CV version of David Altschler, and that is very impressive. He's currently uh, the Executive Vice President for Global Research and the Chief Scientific Officer at Vortex, Vertex, excuse me, overseeing the company's four research sites in the United States and Europe. He was previously um, the founding core member and the Deputy Director and Chief Academic Officer at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. I remember him from the Genome Center at the Whitehead, uh, which then eventually came together to form the Broad Institute. And he's also an endocrinologist at MGH. So please, everyone, welcome David. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Before I launch into the talk, I'd just like to say there are three things I'd like to leave you with today. The first is the idea that in the goal of improving human health, I'm gonna make the case that actually the discovery of new medicines is actually one of the most powerful tools we have. The second is, if you wanna discover new medicines, you have to really focus on two things. One is the underlying biology of people, of human beings, and the other is innovations in how you can use that knowledge of the underlying human biology to actually help somebody. And then the third is, I'm gonna talk about two examples, cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease that I think illustrate these principles. But to begin, I'm actually gonna go back in time, uh, 34 years, uh, to my first day in medical school. Um, the first day uh, when you start at Harvard Medical School, they give you this pamphlet uh, written by a great Harvard doctor, Francis Weld Peabody in 1927. And this pamphlet has the following quotation in it. One of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity, for the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. Now, I have to admit, when I read that, I thought, why else would you go to medical school if you weren't interested in human beings? But I actually came to understand over time that actually there was a countercurrent to this idea. It was actually the idea that we could learn everything we needed to know about biology from simple reductionist systems, cells in a dish, 
mice, fruit flies, worms, yeast, and that actually we didn't really need to bother anymore with studying people. That was kind of retro. And if you don't believe that, I'll show you the next document, which actually I didn't read for about 20 years after it was written, but was published a month before. And that is actually this uh, editorial in Nature from July 1986, on the occasion of the now famous meeting at Cold Spring Harbor Labs, where two things happened. The first was the, the, the presentation of the first two genes identified by the then new tools of human genetics. One, the Duchenne muscular dystrophy gene by Lou Kunkel at Children's Hospital, and the other, the chronic granulomatous disease gene, actually also at Children's Hospital Boston by another Harvard professor, Stu Orkin, who will come up in my talk later. So that was one thing that happened at that meeting. The other thing that happened at that meeting was that uh, the idea of sequencing the human genome was first discussed in an organized setting, and it was controversial, and it led to this editorial, which said, and you can just read it for yourself, the proper study of man, it begins, there is no scientific reason for studying man. And if you don't believe that, if you think I'm misquoting it, I'd be happy to provide a copy of this, it's available online. And basically it goes on to say so many things that are wrong, that it just gives, I mentioned it for the students, to go understand that like, we actually do change our understanding and our perspective over 35 years. Because what it says is that we actually learned a few things from studying human beings, but actually we don't really need to. Human beings are only useful insofar as there are billions of them on the planet and there are some very rare things we might not find in our fruit flies and our mice, et cetera. And they actually go on to say, uh, this is a quote from it, because they had just found the genes for muscular dystrophy. It had been a month or two. And the person went on to say, if the skill and ingenuity of modern biology are already stretched to interpret sequences of known importance, such as those of these genes we've known about for a month, what possible use could be made of more sequences? Now, if I let myself, I'll go on about all the things that were wrong about this. But nonetheless, the main point was, and it is the world in which I grew up as a young scientist at, at Harvard and physician, was that you didn't really need to worry about human beings anymore. You could do everything in the laboratory, do everything in simple models. So now I'm going to flash forward 29 years to the 25th reunion of my Harvard Medical School class. This is now five years ago, where an informal survey, admittedly this is not a scientific survey, said, what are the greatest advances in medicine, in human health, with admittedly a bit of a Western bias uh, as I look at it now in retrospect, um, that occurred in the last uh, 25 years since we were in medical school. And the list here uh, includes things that I think are pretty inarguable, like conquering HIV and AIDS. Um, and also hepatitis C later, uh, more, very recently. Reductions in heart disease uh, and heart attack uh, due to, in particular, uh, widespread use of cholesterol-lowering medicines and blood pressure-lowering medicines, but also cardiac interventions. Cigarette smoking, of course, an incredible impact. Uh, H. pylori uh, for peptic ulcer disease, which was the number one cause of surgery at Mass General and the number one medicine in America when I entered medical school. When was the last time anyone heard of anyone having a bleeding ulcer? That's because the human biology of peptic ulcer disease was worked out. And if you ask how many of these advances were due to a new therapy, it's actually most of them. Okay, so this is, and by the way, how many of them came from the awesome tools of modern, you know, this or that? Well, actually, most of them came from human investigation that led to some understanding of a disease. Now, I will note, just to embarrass him, that the person responsible for three of the things on this list is actually sitting about 10 rows back. Ed Skolnick, who's sitting here, who um, was, uh, was the legendary leader of Merck Research for 18 years, as well as doing many other things, did discover and lead the discovery of Crixivan as the first triple therapy for HIV, uh, the first statins, which lowered cholesterol, and the first uh, recombinant HPV, and also led the HPV vaccine. I'm not sure if I left anything off, Ed. Um, but um, these things come from people I, coming up with ideas and then pursuing them. So, so that's my introduction. And yet, the discovery of new medicines is still very hard. And I'm going to talk about this for a few minutes before I get to the examples. So any attempt to discover a new medicine starts with what's called a therapeutic hypothesis. You say, well, if I could do that, uh, you know, modulate some, the effect of some protein, I might help a person with a disease or a set of people. And initially, if you go back, you know, 100 years, it was serendipity. You know, there'd be some plant that people ate and they felt better and they purified it. Then later, it was human physiology, studying metabolism, studying hormones. It turns out 40% of the entire pharmacopoeia is either a hor hormones or hormone receptors. And then more recently, 
it actually became convenient cell and animal models. And one of the reasons for that is they were very convenient and you could do a lot of things. And they're very rigorous. You could actually ask very precise questions. And then many therapeutic hypotheses were developed based on, in fact, it became sort of de rigueur that you would actually test all of your therapeutic compounds and require them to work in all sorts of models before you'd be willing to test them in people. And while I'm not going to draw a direct causal link to the next slide, it is also a fact that over this period of time, the productivity of the pharmaceutical industry plummeted. And so this is a slide that just shows it's not from my work, it's from a published uh, paper, but the number of dollars it takes to discover and develop a new medicine or number of medicines per uh, dollar spent has gone down with time. This is exactly the opposite of what you'd like to see. You'd like to see that we can do better with time. And so the question is, why is it so hard to discover new medicines, and why are we not doing better at it? And if you ask, and again, there's many contributions to this, but the one that I focus most on is the recognition that of compounds that go into the clinic, of new medicines that are tested in human beings, it takes about 15 today to get one that comes out the other end as a safe, effective, approved medicine. So that says that despite all of our powerful biology and chemistry and armamentaria, the things that are being tested in people don't work at a high, as high a rate as we would like. And the good news is it turns out that very relatively little of this is due to safety concerns because people have become much better and the field has become much better at predicting possible safety concerns. It turns out that this is hard fundamentally because we don't really understand human biology. We're not quite sure exactly what to modulate. Predicting benefits is hard, what would actually help the person with the disease. And also safety is thankfully paramount. First, do no harm. And so the therapy has to be safe and well tolerated by people. It just turns out it's very hard to predict in advance what will happen. But a really uh, a striking part of why it's hard to develop medicines is in order to enter that testing in people, which is the clinical candidates, you actually have to work for many years to discover a clinical candidate, a medicine that could go into people, that actually is not only potent and can do the thing you want, but it has to be, uh, it has to have safety, it has to be something you can manufacture, it can't be metabolized, it has to be absorbed if it's an oral drug or through IV. There's a lot of things that have to get done. So it's many, many years. Then you do the clinical trial, and it's about, on average in the industry, 10 years after stating your therapeutic hypothesis, that you get to test it in what's called a phase two study. A phase two study is the first time you discover in people whether or not you ask the question, does this actually help people who are, have this disease? And the striking finding is that in the field at large, a substantial fraction of the time, the answer is no, there isn't a benefit. It's not that it's unsafe, it's just not a benefit, which is one way of saying the therapeutic hypothesis didn't hold. But it takes a long time to do that, and it's not ideal to be pursuing things that don't at a fairly high rate turn out to work in people. So then the question is, how are we going to do this better? How are we actually going to discover medicines and have an effective process to do this? And you know, this simple framework says there are five things, and it's just an arbitrary framework, five things that are important to discover a new medicine. The first is you really need to understand the disease and the target you're going after. The more you know about it in people, the better your ability to predict what will happen if you test that in people. You need a therapeutic approach, and often, as human genetics and other types of science have shown us the causes of human disease, there's a frustrating challenge, which is we might actually know the underlying biology, but we don't have a therapeutic tool to address it. And that's why therapeutic innovation is so important, to do what needs to be done, rather than what's convenient to do with existing tools. The third is, you need a way to model what's going on in the laboratory, so you can do experiments to test whether or not it seems to be working. And you need models that predict what goes on in the clinic, and you need measurements in the clinic to ask, am I seeing in the clinic what I saw in the laboratory, what are called biomarkers. And one of the keys is to have those measurements in the laboratory and also in the clinic, so you can tell early on, is this working, such that there's potential for benefit, or if not, perhaps you want to stop and work on something else. The fourth is, you can't rely only on short-term measures. You need a path to see long-term. Is this really helping you? And finally, not to be minimized, actually being able to manufacture medicines at scale and provide access to people is actually a substantial, it's a whole science and industry unto itself to be able to do those things. And if you can't do all of these things and your goal is to impact human health, you don't succeed. Because if any one of these, that's why it's so hard to discover medicines, everything has to go right. Because if any one of these or other steps, and there's hundreds I haven't mentioned, doesn't go right, you simply have to stop and go back to the beginning. <laughs>
So two, three things I want to mention before I, I get into the examples that have happened that I think offer new opportunities. One is the genetic mapping of human disease. And so I was drawn to human genetics uh, as a, I, I went into the field actually not when I was coming out of college, but when I was actually a resident at Mass General Hospital. And going through a process, was, I'd done an MD and a PhD, I was taking care of patients uh, in, in Mass General, and I was really struggling with, and my wife is in the front row and can remember my angst, how is it that we can connect the patients we're caring for every day with the underlying workings of the cell and of genes and of mechanism such that we might be able to understand it and do something about it. And then there was this sort of bell that went off, which was human genetics was a way to do that because genetics is relatively unique among sciences insofar as you can start at with a organismal uh, characteristic, what's called a phenotype, and get all the way from that organismal phenotype to the inner workings of the cell and know that it's causal, not some sort of epiphenomenon or just association. And so it wasn't possible to find the genes for human disease until the 1980s, when a series of advances that I'm not going to go through in detail uh, came through. And I told you in 1986 in May at Cold Spring Harbor, the first two genes using these new approaches were identified. And the graph on the left, Mendelian diseases, shows from 1986 when the first genetic map was first produced that made it possible to do these things and the first genes were found to today, essentially, you know, many thousands of the, so, of the supposed 6,000 human Mendelian diseases, we actually know the underlying genetic causes of most of them. But until actually around uh, 15 years ago, we had no ability to understand the much more common phenomenon of traits that are caused not by one gene being uh, altered, but by many genes and the environment. And that's the tools that um, I was, had the pleasure of working with many colleagues around the world building on the Human Genome Project to study human genetic variation and develop methods to characterize that variation and test it for its role in disease. And on the right is a slide from 2010 where we were still counting the number of gene variants we'd found that affected disease. And they were first one and they were 10 or 20. I think there's 60,000 now that have been found since 2007, so you can't make a graph of them anymore. But, um, and the characteristics of complex disease, which I'm happy to take questions on later, is not that there's one gene that affects the disease, but there are often thousands of variants that are often common of small effect and also rare variants, plus the environment working in a much more complex way, but actually still giving insights from the disease to the inner workings of the cell. So that's one thing. We live in an era now where we have a lot of information we didn't have before. Information's not knowledge. It doesn't mean that we know what to do, but it's like we have access to a library we didn't have before, connecting human diseases to the inner workings of a cell. The second is there's been tremendous evolution of the modalities to do treatment. And the reason this is important is if you're going to start with the patient and use some method, genetics is one such method, there are others, and say, now I know what needs to be done to help this person they need to have a tool to do that in people. And it turns out the original medicines were all what are called small molecules. They were chemicals that you could take by mouth, generally, because um, they weren't destroyed by your digestive system. They'd be absorbed, and then they would go into your bloodstream. And in general, what people did, and this is an oversimplification, is they either tried to reduce the activity or something of something, or they try and increase it. So examples of this are like a medicine that blocked a protein that actually was involved in hepatitis C. OK, that one was discovered by Vertex. But nonetheless, um, that uh, it blocked the function of a protein and stopped it, and then something good happened, in this case, stopping a virus. Or thyroid hormone, which is the next one, which replaces a naturally occurring chemical when people have hypothyroidism, which up to 10% of, of certain groups of people have in this society. But you can just take it by mouth. It restores it. That was a tremendous advance. That's endocrinology. You don't have enough thyroid hormone being turned into a pharmaceutical product. You synthesize it, and then everyone takes it, and there's no more, generally, not much of a problem with hypothyroidism. But there are only certain kinds of proteins that you can address with these molecules. So the next big advance was in the 1980s, along with that human genetics, another thing that happened was the ability to cut and splice DNA and to make uh, bacteria or cells to produce proteins. So then there was, again, some proteins that reduced the activity. That's Humira. Uh, that top one, which is uh, one of the most widely used and effective uh, medicines uh, for inflammatory conditions, or like insulin, add back insulin. That's a protein made by biotechnology. And more recently, we have the ability to use nucleic acid therapies, uh, genes or viruses and the like. And there's examples here of things both that can reduce the activity of a protein, 
or of a gene and therefore a disease or add back something. An idea that is more recent is the ability of correcting things. So what's correction? If in this simplified framework, there's blocking something, there's an activity you want to stop it, or there's adding something back, correction is there's something in the body and you want to modify it in some way so now it works again, okay, in a way that maybe it, it's in the body but you're modifying it. And the two examples I'm going to talk about are both Vertex discoveries or Vertex and partners in the case of CTX01, one of which is the development and discovery of the first protein folding correctors uh, for any disease, but which we've done now in cystic fibrosis and are now working on a second disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin, uh, which I won't talk about today. And then the other is the use of CRISPR gene editing uh, to change the DNA to try and correct something and be able to help patients. So what really I want you to take away from this is one, there's an evolution of therapy but also that what each of these therapies allow you to do is tackle a set of problems that people have that you couldn't tackle with the other approaches. Because if you could, there's really no need to use the new technologies. You'd probably prefer to use the old ones because there's decades of experience, they're more mature, you know what to do. The general drive to use new things is actually that you can't solve the patient's problem, and now there's a tool that makes it possible to do that. The final thing I said you needed was you need measurements in the laboratory and you need measurements in the clinic. And the reason this is so important, I can't overstate how important this is. Because if you have all those things I described, but you choose a laboratory model that actually doesn't faithfully recapitulate the aspect of the biology that's relevant to the patient, you can make a wrong turn and, you know, and go in the wrong direction, end up with a medicine that won't help. And if you can't measure in people what's happening, then you won't know if it's working. And the example I'm gonna give in CF, I'm gonna explain it to you in a little more detail, is cystic fibrosis is fundamentally a disease of chloride transport. Chloride, sodium chloride is table salt. Your cells are filled with sodium and chloride, and you have proteins that move that around to make sure you have the right levels. And it turns out that in people with cystic fibrosis, and I'm gonna describe this in a minute, the CF gene, CFTR gene, that is uh, inherited mutations, no longer can transport chloride. And that results in a measurement in the sweat, if you measure sweat, that there's more chloride than would normally be the case. That in and of itself doesn't cause a disease, it's a marker. And it turns out though that that simple effect of CFTR protein affecting chloride explains all of the disease manifestations. So when scientists at Vertex started working 20 years ago to discover medicines for CF, they started using human cells from the lungs of patients and they started measuring the chloride transport. They said, we're not gonna use some convenient cell that is a cancer-like cell that grows indefinitely and conveniently in the lab. That's what a lot of laboratory work does. They use cells that grow without limit. They said, we'll use patient-derived cells, and we won't measure some easily measured marker. We'll actually measure the function of the protein, the chloride. And as you'll see now, there are four medicines that are FDA-approved medicines that came out of that effort, all from this one team at Vertex, all discovered using these cells. And there were others who tried to do this, but they used more convenient cells or other measures, and they actually never got there in part, I think, because they didn't stay true to the underlying biology that the gene was telling you about, although there, there may be other reasons. All right, so now I'm gonna to turn to my examples. That's the, the framework. Now I'm gonna to turn to the two examples. First, cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis, I am proud to represent Vertex here. I should be clear, I joined Vertex five years ago, and this project began 20 years ago at Vertex. And the same team that uh, has been involved in this has been doing this work for those 20 years. And so certainly, um, I have great pride to work with them, but they, they and all the people at Vertex deserve all the credit. And so what I'm gonna tell you is a story that actually goes back uh, 80 years uh, to the discovery of the disease, but 20 years ago, uh, this team at Vertex, led by Paul Negulescu, involving Sabine Hadidia, Peter Grutenhaus, Fred Van Gore, and others, said, we're gonna make small molecules that can correct in a, make a medicine, a pill you could take, that'll make the protein that has a mutation and it doesn't work, make it work again. And they did this, and it's a relatively uh, you know, a small company, a small site, and they discovered all four of the medicines that are now on the market today to do that. And I, I think that may be unprecedented, actually. Ed is nodding his head. For one, there are other combination therapies, like in HIV and HCV, but different companies discovered the different pieces, and then they were combined later. This is, I think, the only case I know of where there's three different mechanisms of action that were required to, to make real progress in a disease, and all of them were discovered, not just by the same company, but actually uh, by the same team. So um, the disease was discovered, and there's someone in the audience who it turns out is a historian of science of cystic fibrosis. So I like, had a shiver, because I'm like, I like to talk about history, but I'm like, someone in the audience knows much more about this than I do, but she said what I'm about to say is true. Um, Dorothy Anderson first described this disease in 1938. 
And the reason I like to go back to that is because it's important for, again, the students in the room to realize it's not like we know about these things forever. There was no cystic fibrosis. And then this woman, Dorothy Anderson, who was one of the first female faculty members at a US medical school, was uh, doing an autopsy. She was a pathologist on somebody who had a, a, what they thought was a different disease, celiac disease, and found these cystic, uh, which means like a, a duct, a tube that is a balloon to be larger than its normal size, a cystic fibrosis, scarring, a cystic fibrosis in the pancreas and also in the lungs, and then actually did a literature search, which I actually didn't know until like a half an hour ago, but some of this person told me this, that did a literature search and gathered all the cases and then described this in a paper. So I mentioned that to say like there was no concept of cystic fibrosis until 1938. Now what's amazing is that for 50 years after that, no one knew what caused it. Now a lot of progress was made clinically because people used to die with this disease as small children. And so progress was made just figuring out how to get food into them because they have malabsorption, to try and help them with oxygen and clearing secretions, if they have infections, to try and later uh, treat their infections, to do symptomatic supportive care. Um, and it's a, it turns out that it's effective. People live longer lives than they did, and they lead better lives than they did, but it's a huge burden. This disease manifests by lung disease, uh, coughing, lung infection, shortness of breath, and over time, that's generally what leads to uh, early mortality and also poor weight gain because of both uh, liver, pancreas, and GI problems, and then also other things like male infertility, all of which are explained, as I'll, as I'll tell you, from one gene that has mutation. And people with this disease today typically take eight to 10 medicines a day. They spend two to three hours a day in lung therapy because it turns out wearing a vibrating chest uh, uh, device that helps mobilize secretions so they can cough them up, extends life, but it's two or three hours a day. They on average spend 20 days a year in the hospital and it's their lung disease that is the leading cause of death. So this is a very serious life-threatening disease that has impact on people's lives and the, the uh, median age of death is around 40. So it's, it's a, you know, it, and that's better than it used to be, but it's still, uh, by the time people are in their teens, it's often the defining aspect of their life. So the gene was discovered that explains this. It's a single gene disorder. It was discovered in 1989 uh, by an international consortium. And um, I won't do it here, but for Immaculata and at least a couple of other people, there's this picture of a young man with cystic fibrosis on the cover of Science, and then there's these bars that are orange and red and blue and green. Does anyone know what those bars are? Just for fun, a little, I used to be a genetics geek. Those are haplotypes. If you've ever heard of the HapMap or the Haplotype Map Project, which is something I was very involved in, that actually was not some newfangled idea that came from the Human Genome Project. The cystic fibrosis gene, and there were others, was that the CF gene was actually discovered by recognizing that a high proportion of the people with this disease, like 70% of them, had one copy of the genome, what's called a haplotype, and what Jicky may talk about it when she comes 23 me. one ancestral copy, Skip Gates talks about this on his TV show, one ancestral copy of the genome that they all inherited from a shared ancestor. And it turned out that that copy, which is the red copy, which is only found in very small numbers of people who don't have CF and very large numbers, about 70% of all of the variant copies of CFTR in patients with CF are this one mutation, is what's called Delta F508, which will become the key to unlocking therapy for CF, the Delta F508 mutation. So there's one common variant and then thousands of rare variants in this gene that when you get two copies, it's a recessive disease, causes the disease. Great work done by scientists before Vertex got involved sort of scoped out the problem. And I'm gonna mention three things that they learned I think it's three, two or three, I'll find out in a minute. Uh, two or three things that, that I brought to tell you that they learned that shaped the problem of how to try and address this disease. The first is they, the academic researchers studying this gene, once they'd found the gene, studied its function. They figured out, one, it transports chloride. And remember I told you that the sweat of people with this, with this disease has extra chloride, that the manifestations are thick secretions, and those thick secretions are have too much chloride in them, chloride dehydrates. So the, the disease all made sense. Cystic fibrosis is a defect in CFTR, which is a chloride transporter. When you have a mutation in that gene or two copies of it, you lower the function of it, you get thick, sticky mucus and blockages in your lungs and your pancreas, and that leads to all the manifestations of the disease, and that's still thought to be true today. They also figured out there were many different mutations, and they had different effects on the protein. One set of mutations, had the following property. The mutation got to, the protein I should say, got to the surface of the cell, 
where it acts to transport chloride, but it didn't transport chloride. It gets to the right location, but the channel couldn't open. And those were called, uh, those are defective gating, because gating is opening the channel. And the field coined a term that if you could ever figure out how to open the channel that was closed, that would be called a potentiator. The idea of a medicine that could potentiate the function of a protein. It turned out another class of mutations, uh, which turned out to be 90% of people carry this delta F508 in one or two copies, and it's in the second class. There were two problems. The first is the protein never got to the surface. The protein was made, but it got stuck in the, in the guts of the cell and never made it to the surface. So that's a problem. If you don't have the protein where it needs to be, how does it work? And then Mike Welsh, who's at University of Iowa, did a very clever geneticist's experiment. He lowered the temperature of some lung cells of people who had the Delta F508 common mutation in CF and saw that if you lowered the temperature just a few degrees, the protein went to the surface. And when you lower the temperature and something gets right, it's a geneticist trick called a temperature shift experiment. It tells you the protein's very close to working because just lower, changing the thermodynamics a little bit is not gonna rescue a fundamentally broken protein. But if it's very close to working and you lower the temperature and you change the, the sort of jiggling of the protein and now it works, that tells you that it's very close. And that was absolutely key insight for the team at Vertex who started working on this. They said if lowering the temperature can get it to go to the surface, then maybe we could make a small molecule that could do that. But they also, Mike Welsh also showed that when it got to the cell surface, it didn't open. So there were like two problems if you want to treat Delta F508. One was you'd have to figure out how to get it to the surface, which no one had ever done for any, any medicine ever, was create a small molecule that could get a protein from the guts of the cell, a mutant protein, to the surface. And then you had a hope that you could discover another medicine that would open the channel and that that would work both for the gating mutations and the mutant CFTR, pro, uh, Delta F508. And then finally, about 7% of people with CF inherit two copies of the gene that makes no protein. So they, they're gonna need some sort of genetic therapy where you replace the gene. But 90 plus percent of people do make a protein, it just doesn't work. Now, that's one insight. The second insight that was key was how much of the protein you need to restore function of. And the reason this is important for anyone who's interested in drug discovery or therapeutics is, it's not enough just to know the protein doesn't work or needs to be turned up or down or corrected. You need to know how much. You need to know, do I need to change it 5% or 95%? And I'm not gonna go through this slide in detail for time, but what this slide showed was that there are different mutations in the CFTR gene, what's called an allelic series. And the different mutations have different intrinsic amounts of CFTR function. And people did epidemiology and said, essentially, if you have a really severe mutation, you have severe CF. But if you have a little bit of function, you have actually considerably more mild CF. And if you have like, could get to 30 or 40% function, it's actually pretty mild. And if you get to 50% or carrier levels, which is more than 50%, you, you essentially have no disease. That told the team, again, how much function you needed to measure in your lung cells to know that you were on track to have something that would work. Remember, my framework was, you don't wanna go into the clinic until you have a really good idea it's gonna work. So you needed to know what to do and how much of it you had to do. So this quote, uh, and there's a couple of others, but I just wanna try and put people back in the time before this was done. This was considered absolute science fiction. The idea that you could make a small molecule that would correct the function of a protein. Ed, is that science fiction 20 years ago? He's nodding. Um, he's right there, you can ask him. Um, now, Francis Collins has this quote here. He's the director of the NIH. He co-discoverer of the CFTR gene. Everyone thought it would be gene therapy. They just thought there's no way to do this other than to reintroduce a gene. But 30 years later, there is no gene therapy for this disease. And it's a very hard problem because the diseased lungs of people with CF and not to mention their pancreas and their guts and their, and their intestines and their liver all would need to be tr you know, transduced to the gene and just a very hard problem. So in 20 years ago, um, a project was started, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, which is a parent or, and, and a caregiver organization that's uh, been terrific in this field, put out a RFA, a request for applications. Would anyone like to try and work on making a small molecule? And only two parties responded. And one of them was our San Diego lab. And they said, well, we'll try it. And they got started and they wrote a proposal. And what they wrote 20 years ago is essentially what ended up happening over the last 20 years. So I'm gonna tell you now this story in two parts because remember I told you there's the protein that doesn't open at the surface and there's a second part which is to get it to the surface and then try and open it. These two were actually done in parallel. It was always the goal of this Vertex team to develop something that would treat most people. But it turned out uh, that, it's, uh, that they got first to the one that opens the channel at the surface 
And we have long-term follow-up on that, so I'm gonna show you that first to give you a sense of what happens, not just short-term, but long-term. And then I'm gonna go back and say, and what happened with Delta F508? The punchline is we now have medicines that can be used to treat, that are approved in America for treating 90% of people with C, medicines that have genotypes that for the right age groups, because we're only approved 12 and above, um, are for 90% of people with CF. But I'm gonna tell you the story in two parts. So the potentiator, remember, is the medicine that would be to get the medicine that, the protein that is on the surface, get it to open so it can transport chloride. And they worked for five years, five years, and then they discovered, and we're going back now 16 years ago, because they've been doing this for 20 years. Five years ago, they discovered a medicine, a candidate medicine, that in the laboratory could open the channel. And here on the left is these human bronchial epithelial cells. These are cells taken from the lungs of people who donated their lungs to science with cystic fibrosis. And on the, the y-axis is the amount of chloride transport, which is the relevant physiology. And on the left is these people have a particular gating mutation, and there's no chloride transport. And you add what's now called Ivacaftor, um, and it makes the chloride transport go to about 50%. And then they did clinical trials. And this is the phase three data from the New England Journal of Medicine. This is 11 years into the program, which is nine years ago. And what you see here on the y-axis is the change in lung function as measured by a readily measured something called FEV1, which is how much air you can move out of your lungs in and out. It's not really the disease cystic fibrosis, but is a measure of the lung function of the disease cystic fibrosis. And it's the one the FDA and the regulators in Europe and around the world use to say, does the medicine work? And what you can see here is that the placebo, which is the black line, there was no change. I'll come to what happens at 48 weeks. But the people who were put on the medicine, these are people who had the genotype that would respond to this medicine, had a uh, increase of about 10% in their FEV1 within two weeks. And that was maintained over time. And if you ask people who worked in this program, were you ever shocked? What was the shock? Uh, Fred Van Gore, who's been the biology lead for 18 years, said um, there were two times he cried. I'll tell you the second one in a minute. But the first time was this time. And the reason was because they had, everyone had convinced themselves, the field had convinced themselves that this approach of using human genetics and fixing the underlying cause probably wouldn't lead to any short-term benefits. And the idea was, if you have the, if you ever heard the horses out of the barn, you don't close the barn door, the horse already gone. The idea was the genetics was opening the barn door, and if the horse had already run out, it was too late. But no one knew, of course, because no one had ever had a method to restore CFTR function. It just turns out the whole system that you need to clear uh, your lungs, the mucus and the, uh, the cilia that spin is sitting there in people with this disease, but it's not working because of the mutation. And when you restore CFTR function, it all starts, it starts working again, and then they actually have acute benefit. So that's great. And there are other things that, that I won't go through that these papers are all published in the England Journal, so you can look them up if you're interested in the, in the data. Not only the acute change in lung function, which the placebo group also saw, that's what happened at 48 weeks, was the placebo group was given the opportunity to transfer onto the medicine, and they had a similar thing happen, but other measures like reduction in how many times that people were hospitalized weight gain because they now could absorb food and other such measures, patient reported outcomes about how they felt all improved. But what about long term? This is still less than a year. What about long term? So there are two so this medicine, Ivacaft, was approved for its initial indication in 2012. So we're now eight years. Uh, into its being on the market, and there's real world evidence, which means people not in clinical trials, but who take it, and there are patient registries of people who weren't on it or historical, so you can ask, what's the difference when you take this medicine versus not over time? And there are two things I'm gonna show you. One is slowing the rate of decline in lung function, which is something that happens to people with CF, they lose about 1.7% of their lung function per year, that's about halved in people who are on Ivacaftor. So not only do they get, if it's 1.7% per year, and it's a 10% change, that's five or six years back, if you will, compared to the late rate of loss, but also it, it then progresses at a slower rate. But perhaps more profound is the long-term outcome data. This is the data from two registries, one in the US, one in Europe, one in the UK, independent registries. So these are two independent replicates of the findings, and you see lower rates of, of infections, of hospitalization, of transplant, and notably 50 to 60% reduction in mortality uh, after years on this medicine. So this is truly disease-modifying therapy. It's not just a symptomatic therapy. It's affecting the progression of the disease. So that's about 5% of people with CF have mutations that will respond to that disease. The question is, could you ever get to the majority of people who don't have those mutations but have Delta F508 in either one or two copies. And so the company was working on that for 20 years. That's a harder problem, as I said. They had to do two things. 
And basically, I'm going to leap forward and say in 2015, the first such medicine was approved, and in 2018, the second such medicine was approved, both discovered in our San Diego labs, both developed and brought to market by Vertex. And what you see here is uh, the results for a phase three trial published in the Journal of Medicine using that same lung function measure. And what, I'm, what, I, what I want you to note is there is still a very clear, rapid increase in lung function, but it's not as large an effect. In this trial, it's about 4% as opposed to 10 in the previous one. And that's proportional to the change in chloride function as measured with the sweat and in the human bronchial epithelial cells. It turned out to be very hard to actually find medicines that could get that protein to the surface it turns out the potentiator Ivacaftor does open it at the surface. That's not the problem. It's just very hard because we tracked all this to get a lot of the protein out of the cell's machinery, the endoplasmic reticulum, up to the surface. So the team doubled down and said, even while these medicines were going forward, and said, maybe there's a way we can add another medicine to this. Those were two medicines. Could we add a third that might further augment this effect. So they went back and basically screened again for small molecules on top of the first two that could get you further. And um, when I joined the company in 2015, we were struggling to get from uh, pharmacology, which was in the cells they could get there, they could get much higher levels, to discovering medicines, things that had all those properties that you could go in the clinic. And we basically decided to, to invest every resource we had to try and f solve this problem, because we knew from the first two uh, from the first three medicines that if you could get higher levels, this would translate and you'd be able to treat 90% of people who have one or two copies of CF. And a typical drug discovery program has something like a thousand or fewer molecules made in what's called lead optimization medicinal chemistry, which is optimizing the chemical. Each chemist making one molecule, one change to one atom. Synthesize it, test it in the lab, is it better? Go do it again. Typical programs add on hundreds to a thousand. This program is now up to 40,000. So it's, it's, we, had, we tried incredible things to try and find a way to do this. And the long and the short of it is that they did it. And in 2016, uh, so only four years ago, we discovered a molecule called VX445. We actually discovered a whole suite of these molecules and put multiple of them into the clinic. But the x-axis, just like the Ivacaftor data from 14 years ago, is chloride transport. The columns are whether you have one, two, or three. And what you can see on the right is that the third, the last row, which is the three combination, gets you more chloride transport for someone who has one copy of Delta 508 and the other a null mutation, more than we had with Ivacaftor in the G551D cells. And the New England Journal of Medicine papers from 2018 and 19 show that this translated, this is the phase three data that was published in October, I believe, uh, shows a 14% FEV1 change. And this is both, there's two different studies, one in the New England Journal, one in the Lancet, but one of genotypes that comprise 50% of people with CF, the other one genotypes that are 40% of people, and they both, as compared to placebo, would be expected to have about 14% FEV1, and you can read the papers. They describe the effects on reducing the rates of pulmonary exacerbations, uh, the uh, improvements in body mass index, and also uh, the patient-reported outcome measures, which are quite uh, positive. And so uh, this is a sort of remarkable and exciting set of discoveries. This is now on the market. In America, uh, the FDA approved this medicine in 94 days, which was, I believe, the second fastest FDA approval in history. I believe Ivacaftor is the third fastest uh, in history. Um, and um, this medicine has a, has a label that says, for, in America, it's still under review in Europe and, and, and other places in the world, that is for the ages which were approved, because you have to start with older people and then work your way down, for 90% of people with CF genotypes. And, and in addition, the other medicines like Ivacaftor is now approved down to six months. Because it turns out that's how you have to do it. You start with older people and work your way down. So, so for Ivacaftor, now most of the people uh, who have, the vast majority of people who have the right genotypes are treated from six months and beyond. So if you think about it, if you can treat early in life before people have any established disease, hopefully the outcomes will be even better. But that remains to be seen. Um, this is a real community effort. I realize I'm running a little late, but I'm going to just say 157 clinical trials, 413 clinical trial sites, 22 countries, and 13,000 people who participate in our trials. There's only 80,000 people in the world with CF. Okay, and we don't know those 13,000 are actually all different people. Some of them may have participated twice. I can't get that number, but the point is, this isn't, I mean, it is an amazing story. Vertex discovered all these medicines, developed all these medicines, brought these medicines all to market. They were not bought from anyone else or discovered and developed by anyone else, but 
the community of people with CF, the caregivers, uh, and, the, the, and the clinical trial network, we could never have done this without the whole community. So I'm going to take 10 more minutes and talk about sickle cell disease. So that's CF. But our ambition is greater than just to work on CF, although certainly for a lifetime, that's a very gratifying thing, I think, uh, to have been a part of, certainly for me. But we have higher ambitions, which is to take the capabilities and our strategy and our resources and do it for other diseases, do the same type of thing. And we tell you briefly about sickle cell disease. This is your CRISPR scenario, and I promise to bring some information on CRISPR. It's much e earlier. So I just want to be clear, that's four medicines in the market, multiple phase three programs. I'm going to tell you about some very early research on CRISPR. We do have the first human data to tell you about, which I think, to our understanding, is the first time CRISPR has been used to treat a genetic disease. And, and we disclosed that a couple of months ago, and I'll just tell you about that. So sickle cell disease is another very serious life-threatening disease. About 100,000 people in America and, and hundreds of thousands a year born around the world. This is not an uncommon disease. There's actually two diseases, both caused by mutations in the beta globin gene that, is the, uh, that makes the hemoglobin, one of the chains of hemoglobin in your blood. And if you have a particular mutation in it, you get what's called sickle cell disease. And if you have a different mutation where you don't make any, you get what's called beta thalassemia. And these are very serious life-threatening diseases that have a huge impact on people's lives. Uh, they have to have uh, regular care. They're often not able to go to school or work. And they have life expands that are similar to that of CF. So just understand, this isn't equally, or you, know, you can't really compare but any two diseases, but it's very severe life-threatening disease. The history of this one goes back further. This one actually, Linus Pauling published this paper in 1949 called Sickle Cell Anemia, a Molecular Disease, where he showed that if you ran out the, on a gel the protein hemoglobin from people with sickle cell disease, it migrated differently. It had a different charge. And this was actually the first molecular disease. It was the first time a human gene was connected to a human protein, was connected to a human phenotype. This wasn't just about disease. This was one of the foundational uh, observations. But nonetheless, this is 1949. And Vern Ingram figured out exactly what the change was in 53 and 56. And yet, today, you know, still it care is very inadequate. So I told you, I won't go through it again, all the things you need to do to try and discover a medicine. You need to understand the disease. You need to have a therapeutic approach. You need to have ways to model it, et cetera. And there's multiple ways to do this that are being done with CF. I'm going to tell you about the one with sickle cell. I'll tell you about the one that we're doing uh, with our partner, CRISPR Therapeutics, also here in Cambridge, Mass. We ended up deciding to pursue what's called fetal globin. So fetal globin is a form of globin that we all have in our body that we express when we're fetuses. And the reason we have it is because if you think about it, the mother has a blood supply that has oxygen in it, and the fetus has to get oxygen from the mother. And the mother actually, baby needs to actually be able to have a higher affinity hemoglobin so she, the baby can get oxygen off the mother's hemoglobin. So fetal globin, which you express in fetal life, is that globin. And all of our bodies have it. It's kind of like a spare tire, if you will, you know, because we have that gene, but it's turned off in the first year of life. So how do we know that if you could turn back on fetal globin, that that would ser ser uh, serve to help people with this disease? It turns out there are people who inherit something called hereditary persistence of fetal globin. They have mutations that the fetal globin never turns off. And even if they have a mutation with sickle cell, and even if they have a mutation that causes beta thal, if the, the, if the hemoglobin F, as it's called, fetal globin is high enough, they don't get disease. And there's also more common genetic variants discovered through genome-wide association studies that identified a set of genes that had the property that not only could they move the fetal globin, they resulted in higher fetal globin, but the people who had those mutations had less severe symptoms and had less disease. So there's a quantitative relationship. If this reminds you of CF, it's a similar kind of story. And we and our partner, CRISPR Therapeutics, said, um, and, and actually I say Stu Orkin, who uh, mentioned earlier chronic granulomas disease. He um, studied this problem for 30 years. He gives a great talk. If you haven't had him, you should have him come talk. And he talks about 30 years in sort of the wilderness trying to figure out how to turn fetal globin on. And he says that genome-wide association studies were the method that allowed the discovery of variants that have led to uh, how this might be done. But there was no tool to actually do what needed to be done. And the reason is the nature of the problem, which I'm going to, the sake of time, not go through, but it's all published in many nature and cell and science papers from Stu Orkin and many other people, tells you that what you need to do is change a few letters in the DNA, not of a, not a, not of a protein. You actually change a few letters in the regulatory part of the genome. If you actually go back and read that 1986 article about not sequencing the human genome. It says there are no regulatory parts of the human genome. But it turns out there are. That paper was wrong. And it turns out changing those is not something you can do easily with a small molecule. But then this tool CRISPR was discovered. 
And CRISPR uh, offers a highly precise way of editing and changing the DNA that can be done with great precision. If you pick the right guide and you screen carefully, you can find guides that do not have off-target effects. Don't ever believe the off-target effects are a characteristic of CRISPR. They're a characteristic, actually, of the enzyme and the guide you chose and where that guide lands in the genome. So if you screen, you can find very precise, surgical, highly effective gene editing that will change what you would like. And we in CRISPR Therapeutics said together we would go try and use CRISPR to mimic what human genetics had taught us about raising fetal globin in people with sickle cell disease. So first we did it in human cells. We so we in CRISPR Therapeutics, again, its whole thing is a close partnership with that company, uh, discovered and tested guides, characterized them, made sure they had no off-target effects. We've characterized them very extensively. We've never seen a single off-target cut from the guide and the, the way we're doing this with Cas9. And we showed in human cells that if you made the edit that was right in the place that human genetics showed naturally occurring variants could raise fetal globin, that the fetal globin went up. That would be surprising if it didn't work, but it did. In fact, the level of fetal globin we could get in these human cells was on the order of 40% fetal globin. And the reason that's important is that as little as 10% fetal globin can have benefit to people. People who don't have uh, elevated fetal globin um, have you know, 1% or 2% fetal globin. There's no negative consequence that's ever been described of having high fetal globin. There are people who walk around with it because of this hereditary persistence of fetal globin. And the data suggests if you had 20 or 30%, it would probably be curative. And in the cells in a dish, human cells in a dish, we were at 40%. So we reported in November, I believe, uh, the first two patients treated with CTX01. These are human. These are people, who very, very uh, courageous people who agreed to participate in this study because it was the first time CRISPR had been used to treat a genetic disease, and their blood was taken out uh, to get stem cells. The stem cells were edited in a laboratory in a way such that the editing only goes on very briefly, uh, for a period of, of hours or a couple of days, not indefinite. The cells are then tested to make sure everything's fine, and then they're restored back into someone in the form of a bone marrow transplant. And what we saw with this person, um, uh, this first patient with sickle cell disease, the other patient uh, had beta thalassemia, I won't talk about, but, but data was reported, was that this person had uh, 14 vaso-occlusive crises, pain crises, 14 in the two years prior to enrolling in this study. And since the study, has, has, at the time we looked at this, which was four months after the treatment, no vaso-occlusive crises. This person's fetal, fetal globin was about 9%. It's not atypical for these people to have slightly elevated fetal globins. Uh, had 47% in their blood four months after treatment. Their hemoglobin level was in the normal range, and the person was, was doing well. Now, this is one patient, and it's only four months. We have a second patient with beta thal, same treatment, who similarly, this per, the beta thal patient had had uh, transfusions every two to three weeks for her entire life. She was nine months post-treatment. Not only was she not getting transfusions, but she had what's called phlebotomy, because she had iron overload from a lifetime of transfusions, and she was having blood removed and yet maintaining a normal blood level, uh, a hemoglobin level. So the first two patients are very promising, but I don't want to actually go any further than that, because this is very early days with a new technology. What I can say is that sickle cell is a serious life-threatening disease with, that today there's very limited treatment options. And new insights from human genetics and treatment modalities offer multiple approaches. We are one group doing that, Vertex CRISPR, but there are others in academia and industry, and it's tremendously exciting because multiple parties are succeeding. And I do believe in the coming years we will be able not only to cure sickle cell disease, but find ways through science to actually make the end-to-end -end experience better for patients, make this more tolerable, and uh, follow this lead to be able to treat many people around the world. But there's a tremendous amount of science to be done. So I'm, I know I'm late. I'm just going to say the following things. Vertex is working on CF sickle cell. We're also working on muscular dystrophy, pain, using genetically validated targets two other genetic diseases, and recently with Doug Melton here at Harvard, uh, type 1 diabetes, where we're working to, uh, make, Doug has figured out, he's one of Harvard's leading faculty, found ways to both make uh, human beta cells and also to protect them from the immune system, and we're looking to do that in type 1. We acquired that company and are working closely with Doug. So we're working on multiple diseases where we think this strategy can work. I've told you my conclusions, which is that, you know, today the public discourse suggest that actually discovering new medicines and, and the companies that do that 
is not actually uh, is something complicated. I personally think there's a lot of complexity in society, but discovering transformative medicines for serious life-threatening diseases is a wonderful thing that advances medicine and human well-being and is almost entirely done by companies. That's just a fact. The second is that it's extremely challenging and it requires a real focus on human biology and therapeutic innovation. If you don't have those things, I think the likelihood of success is not as high. And I've told you about CF and sickle cell. And even though I'm running late, I'm gonna say two more things. You might have thought that, that humanizing drug discovery was about humanizing the choice of targets. But actually, those are the, that's the least important meaning of humanizing. There's two others I want to leave you with. The first is the people who do it. I was an academic for 30 years, and wherever I go, people ask me, what's it like working in a company? Actually, it's inspiring, OK? Thousands of people working together to actually advance human health. At Vertex, very unusual, I think we're the industry leader in this, three out of the five people at our company, 2,000 or so of the 3,000 people, are in R&D. Only a third are in everything else. And we are, they come to work every day to try and you know, uh, move this ball forward. And the person right here whose picture you see on the right is VG Armukam. She discovered Ivacaftor in that hood that you see behind her. She's never going to win a prize. She doesn't go give lectures. She doesn't actually ask for any recognition. She discovered Ivacaftor. And there are lots of other people I could point to. And so I think the human beings who do this work deserve recognition and credit because actually without it, all the science in the world is not ever going to actually advance human health. And then the last thing, which is more important than that, are the patients we serve. One of the things about working in diseases like CF and sickle cells, you actually get to know the patients. And it's incredibly motivating. All the people on this slide have given us their permission. They all suffer from diseases we're trying to treat. And we get to hear their stories. And that's why those people are willing to go to work every day, even though they don't get the fame and glory because they actually want to help those people. So with that, I'll stop. And if there's time, I'll be happy to take any questions. I knew you wouldn't disappoint. My money's always on David. Thank you. It's very kind. Uh, we have time to take some questions. So if you can line up in the middle. There's a microphone? Yep. I think uh, the recordings, they'd like the questions on the microphone. Yes. Hi, thank you for that very, very interesting lecture. My question is going to perhaps be seen as challenging, but it's, in, it's intended Academic in a very- discourse. Right, 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 okay. <laughs> so I'm Kamara Jones, I'm a Radcliffe Fellow this year. Um, I'm a family physician, PhD epidemiologist. The gist of the question is really about prioritizing investments and prioritizing research agendas and how you as a person think about that, how your company thinks about that, and how you think our society should think about that. And there are two levels. First of all, in terms of prioritizing investments or research questions or research agendas, I, it's my observation that in this country and perhaps all around the world, we have a very narrow focus on the individual, which makes systems and structures and context appear to be either irrelevant or to be invisible, in fact. So that gets to the whole question about would some of the investments that we're making in terms of finances and in terms of brain power and all be for the magnitude of the impact be better on environmental determinants or, or things like schools or taking away, uh, you know, uh, environmental hazards or, yeah. you know, invest. So that's the first, okay. environment versus okay. individual. And yep. then the second level in terms of our prioritizing investments is if you decide to go to the individual and if you decide to go to diseases, human diseases, which diseases? Yeah. So let me answer the two questions. Well, well I haven't, I, okay, I just want to finish. I always say there's many people behind you. I want to make sure I can get to multiple questions, but I'm happy to answer whatever questions you have. So sickle cell versus CF in the order of that, orphan diseases because of profit, malaria, that kind of thing. So that was just to fill out that second yeah. part about diseases. No, I appreciate the question. I think, first of all, we need to do many things to improve human health. I don't actually think, I don't, I'm not actually a zero-sum person, so I don't actually 
love the idea that we should only do one or the other, but I will tell you that our strategy at Vertex is to do the following, okay? We invest in trying to make transformative medicines, by which I mean the first time someone really changes the game for serious, life-threatening disease, and I believe that, the, and we look for diseases where we think we can make a difference. Now, I personally believe that children dying with cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease or Duchenne muscular dystrophy diseases for which there is no environmental cause that you're going to find, there is no other way to help them, is, is actually a very good thing to do. All right, especially when we have things we can do that we know will make a difference for them. So first of all, I feel very good about that. Mm -hmm. The second thing I would say is that the strategy I described of understanding the disease and figuring out an intervention and knowing it's going to work and testing it rigorously, um, I think applies to any intervention. And I think that one of the things that I did start with saying my impression, certainly in, in the Western world, of what's had a huge impact over the last 30 years are some of the things that I listed. So I think, for example, in the fight against heart disease, the number one cause of death, I actually think the data is compelling, not the, not the belief system, but the data that lowering cholesterol with medicines, lowering blood pressure with medicines, and other things as well have made a huge difference in human health at the population level, not just at the individual level. So I don't question your, your, your underlying question, which is, should we be thinking about what makes a difference? But I think it can be very compelling to treat people who, due to no fault of their own, inherit severe genetic diseases where we have the opportunity to help them. And I think we should also be very rigorous in thinking about how we evaluate all of the interventions. And it may be that environment is a really good way to change some things. It may actually be a medicine is a highly scalable way of actually impacting human health that's actually, especially after medicines go generic, like the statins that Ed discovered, actually have huge impact for pennies a day, which actually is part of our ecosystem. So I actually think there's a lot to your question, yes. but those are my beliefs. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Next question. Thanks for a great, uh, great lecture. Um, so in the first part of the talk, uh, you showed a little bit how disheartening the cost of development of new small molecule drugs was, and, and also how long it took to develop new therapeutics, uh, decades. Um, but in the last part of your talk, um, you showed something very encouraging, which was that it seemed like in a matter of years, several, um, a new drug basically had entered human trials, and uh, I'm not sure what the cost was, but I would assume also proportionately lower. Um, could you say something maybe predictive, potentially about how you see maybe the coming decade um, or two in terms of moving from the space of the small molecules on the left from the 80s and 90s and 2000s over to sort of gene editing and, and modulation tools on the right, what's fundamentally different, sort of structurally different about our, how we might expect timelines and, and costs to, to yeah. sort of pan out? I think that there's a number of things in the question. I'll, uh, it's a good question. I would say this. First of all, something that is clearly a cost with no benefit is a high rate of failure to achieve benefit for people. So the strategy I described is one in which we try and be very disciplined, and Vertex were very disciplined about working on targets that we believe address the underlying cause of disease, uh, developing medicines that we think have a higher chance of success. Interestingly, we did get the CF medicine from first synthesis to approval in four years, which is eight years shorter than industry average, but we didn't do it by spending less. We actually did it by moving multiple forward in parallel and investing at risk actually spent much more in the short period of time because we believe the best way to get a medicine to people who needed it was actually not to go in a serial way, which is the traditional way, but actually to take multiple forward in parallels to see which one was the best, move that forward. We actually did two phase three programs. I don't think that's ever been done in history, preparing two medicines for launch so we could give patients the one that was the best. So I think there's a little bit of complexity. I think you can go faster. You actually, sometimes will spend more because you want to do that at risk. With the way that you, if you go slow, it's by dribbling it out and waiting for success. But I do think if we can improve the success rates, we'll have a more efficient and effective way to discover medicines. The one other thing you said was about moving from small molecules to genetic therapies. I don't think we're ever going to stop doing small molecules. I actually think small molecule medicines are actually, to the question about public health, an incredibly scalable way to get medicines to large numbers of people and will still be a mainstay, and is a mainstay. Most prescriptions in America are generic prescriptions that were once actually branded medicine that then went off patent and became generic that are now very scalable. I think the challenge in genetic therapies, and it really is, are we 
are we foresightful enough as a society to invest in the future of human health, and I think we should be, is that actually no one has ever done these genetic therapies until now, so there's actually a substantial learning curve that we're only beginning to get up, and it is actually takes a huge amount of investment to actually treat the first couple of patients. You were asking, you know, is that a good investment? It depends if our time horizon is five years or 50. And now that I've been in medicine for 35 years, 50 doesn't sound so bad. Because I will say that like the idea that we could treat 90% of people with CF or that we could reduce heart disease by 40% in the last 40 years, heart disease death, that is just unbelievable to me. That happened through miracle of new medicines, okay? But it takes time, and so I think to actually figure out how to use these new genetic therapies will take a huge amount of investment and learning, but do I believe that 50 years, I'm gonna say 50 years, because I'm not saying to anyone who's listening, it won't happen in five years. What I'm saying is it's very hard to predict when. But if we make these investments, we will transform human health in the years to come, and we should focus on the biggest problems, which can be something that's very common, or it can be something very severe for a smaller number of people who are suffering due to no cause of their own. Next question. I'll, you can, I'll take questions as long as you let me. So. Hi. Um, I, ha I wanted to talk about the cost of drug discovery innovation. We know that we can't sustain innovation without profitability in this country. Um, one of the reasons why we've had the most number of drug discoveries. Um, I wanted to hear about from your industry perspective, how is Vertex addressing some of these um, you know, risks around how the, the bills that are currently um, in the House around Medicare um, Part D, um, co um, you know, the, the cost-cutting um, bills that are out there that could threaten innovation because at the end of the day, drugs can't get to patients without profitability. You know, there's value-based payment, all these other kind of barriers out there. So I wanted to hear your perspective. My perspective, which maybe not surprise you because I've said it before is, and we do talk about this quite a bit, what do we think is the most valuable thing our company and our team can do for humankind? And we have a particular set of capabilities and strategy. We try and work for the most serious diseases that have no treatment, where we think there's an opportunity to really make something transformative. And there are many things that are beyond our control, but we believe that those are the things society does value. We think it's the things society, frankly, should value. And we think that while we'll be a participant in that debate, if we keep trying to do the things that have the greatest impact on human health and that are not me too's, not for conditions that aren't serious, not things that anyone else could have done, that we will be uh, rewarded by society in an appropriate way. And that's what we aim to do. Let's hope so. <laughs> First, I want to thank you for a very interesting, inspiring talk. Second, I want to ask a very naive question. At least I think it's naive. You mentioned that with <clears throat> sickle cell anemia, you used CRISPR to modify the genes. Yes. What confuses me about that statement is that there are so many cells in the body. Yes. How do you, how do you get to them all? Oh, it's a great question. And in fact, the answer to your, it's not a naive question at all. The answer to your question actually is a part of why we chose sickle cell disease as the first example to do this with. One was the severity of the disease the lack of other treatments. Another was that there were many people around the world, and even though it's not obvious how the very first version of this would work, we think it's on path to treat a disease that is a, you know, a very serious disease around the world. But the second, which gets to your question, is sickle cell disease only involves the blood cells. It only involves the red blood cells. And there are bone marrow transplants, which are a known technology. In other words, we didn't have to invent it. We didn't have to perfect it. It already exists, where you can take out cells from someone's blood, and there's stem cells there, you can do the editing, and when you restore them to the body, they will replace the person's bone marrow and will give rise to the blood. So that is the, and it's called ex vivo, because the gene editing is done in a laboratory, not in the body. And if you're doing this for the first time, what you're saying is how do you get to all the cells, and you might have said, and how do you do it safely? And our answer was for the first time, do it in a laboratory, not in the body, take the cells out, make sure the gene editing uh, uh, machinery is gone before you put it back in the body, and we leveraged the fact that there was a serious disease in sickle cell and beta thalassemia that had this approach already invented where it was known that you could transplant the cells. What wasn't available was how do you change the DNA so you could correct the underlying disease. So it's a very good question. In fact, as genetic therapies advance, it's becoming clear that actually the tools for the genetic modification are getting so good that it's not that it's not a problem, 
but it, it's in hand. It's, it's certainly visible that you could modify the DNA. The question you asked, how do you get to the right cells, is actually where the challenge is going to be. And if you imagine the A limitation, let's say, of our sickle cell approach or any other sickle cell approach is you have to do this ex vivo, which means a bone marrow transplant. You say, well, if you can show that works and it's safe, and we have a lot more work to do to convince ourselves of that, could you imagine delivering it without a bone marrow transplant? Because if you could, then you actually wouldn't have to do a bone marrow transplant. If you could eventually do that, and again, this is now not a prediction, it's just a vision. If you could eventually do it by having it available and you just inject it or, and then it would do the editing, which is today science fiction because no one knows how to do that, your question, then you'd have a therapy that could be used for a lot of people around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> uh, my question is, in your view, where and by how much will artificial intelligence improve drug development? That's a great question and one that's getting a lot of attention today. <laughs> so first of all, I'm very positive on the value of data and data analysis to have a positive impact on a complex process like drug discovery. Vertex has a data science team that reports to me that, that we established that's doing great work and also probably uh, 50 data scientists who work in R&D, because uh, the corporate data science team is actually not only limited to R&D. So I think that the potential, like in almost any other area of life, to try and figure out how to simplify and automate processes or to learn from data sets patterns that can predict hypotheses is, is tremendous. But I think you have to know what the problems are in order to apply it, and I think that for us, we have identified very specific things, either in the laboratory or, frankly, in how we try and make sure we have the best organization we have so that people's lives are better, they can do their work more efficiently. And we're actually finding a lot of return on artificial intelligence, but it's not actually that artificial intelligence is going to take a big data set, I'm not saying anyone else says it will, and discover the drugs. Because there's not enough data, it's not, it's not actually how it works, and that's not what's going to happen. What is going to happen is there are probably dozens or hundreds of problems that are, if you know what the problem is, can be solved with data. And we're looking for those problems, and we're seeing a lot of positive impact. So I don't know if that's too nuanced an answer, but it's a one, it's very valuable. But like any tool, you have to know what the questions are and where that tool can be valuable to apply it. And, uh, and so we're, we're working on that, and I think we're making good progress. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David, and we hope you uh, don't take another 20 years to come. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having me.